Hello, everybody, and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. How is everyone doing this evening? Happy and blessed Tuesday, and welcome to episode 488 of the Welcome to Asgard podcast, where tonight we're going to talk a little bit about a film I just got to see last night, starring the great Anthony Hopkins, a film called One Life. An amazing true story of a man that saved hundreds of, of children from Czechoslovakia, I believe. And just going to share some of my thoughts on it. I've already put my review out on Critic List, but figured I would talk about it here on the channel as well. We'll also talk about some box office numbers, some real box office numbers. No no crazy, crazy creepy spin here. We try to keep the numbers as plainly as we possibly can to help everyone understand it as best as we can. And uh, a little bit of open forum as well. But of course... Keep it within reason. Keep it within reason, as always. Before going into the chat, though, please make sure you smash that like button. Light up that fire button. Aussie, smash the rubble button as well. We are live on all of those platforms here tonight. We got the best chat around. Let's go ahead and say hello to some of the peeps. We got Keely Chow, who was here early, around 444, saying, No cussing, and don't give anyone you don't like the middle finger. Yes, indeed, we keep things very PG here on the channel. We are a family channel here on OMB Reviews. He then went on to say, how are you, Baby Thor, Freya, and Baby Sif doing? Everyone is doing well. Baby Sif has either a little bit of a cold or is struggling with some seasonal allergies. Uh, she's had a bit of a runny nose, a bit of a cough, which has been sad. Uh, but she will still smile right through it. It's just hard for her to to breathe through her nose, which just means that she's she's an unhappy baby when bedtime comes around. But she she still does very well. And uh, Baby Thor, it's just crazy how big he's gotten. I can't believe that the dude is is over three years old uh it'll be turning four this year just kind of insane how much time has gone by i mean you go back to when he was born and that was the covid year that was the year where everything got shut down and in fact um i was just listening to one of my uh, one of the podcasts that i listened to earlier and he was mentioning that we're now on the four year anniversary of when a lot of things shut down specifically when uh, catholic churches shut down their public masses uh, which, of course, just reminds me of how frustrating that entire thing was, how how ridiculous that entire thing was, and I still think there need to be apologies from not just people in government, but also people in the church as well for putting the needs of the body over the needs of the soul. Uh, so it kind of just brought up those old memories again, but uh, obviously we are, we are living in a much better day and time here in 2024, though things, of course, could always be a little bit better. Master of Gaming... Hanging out, what is going on? We got Snorta Poopus Cuber, who's a member, saying, Hello, humans and other quitters. What's going on, Snorta Poopus? Hello to you. Hello. Orange Hat, welcome to Asgard. Behave. Nothing above PG-13, or you will get booted. Orange Hat is one of my king mod. He is the king mod, I should say, here on the channel. And so he will indeed lay down his hammer. Lay down his mighty axe if you decide to misbehave. Master Gaming, get it started with the question right away. Thank you for saying hi first this time, at least. Says, why did Cabrini drop 61% in week two, despite good word of mouth from mainstream critics and audiences like yourself? Because it's a faith-based movie. That's not really uncommon for the faith-based movie crowds to really go see films like this opening weekend. Positive, positive word of mouth obviously can help, but even if you have 100% of the people who are going to see it liking it, if the 100% of the people seeing it opening weekend are a small number of people, that's only going to have so much of an effect. Um, and we'll talk a little bit further about that, especially analyzing it against other releases from Angel Studios, because I think it helps put things into perspective, not taking away the fact, of course, that because of a severely high budget, because of how much money was raised to actually make the film Cabrini, that film is in some financial trouble. It makes me sad. It definitely makes me sad. And so I'm hoping positive word of mouth can help it down the road, but it's oftentimes hard for religious films, especially films about saints in today's world to really be able to break through. It used to be that Hollywood could actually make some pretty awesome movies about saints that actually were, you know, universally acclaimed by, by many, many people. I think back to films like Beckett, right? I think back to uh, films like a man for all seasons. I believe man for all, man for all seasons actually, if it didn't win best picture that year was in contention for it, right? It used to be uh, a time when these were much more widely accepted. Nowadays you, you have a film called Cabrini. Someone looks it up and says, you know, oh, this is about a saint in the Catholic Church. Okay, that's already going to push a lot of people away. To me, it says a lot more about our current society 
uh, and, and current culture. We live in a very anti, uh, anti-Christian time, but especially an anti-Catholic time for various reasons. So that would be my guess. Let's see. Prince Green, who's a member. Hello to you, Prince Green. Hello, everybody in the chat tonight. Hello to you. Sam Blackburn, Daddy say, have you forgiven your son for eating powdered pizza? Well, I don't need to because he has not committed a sin knowing what he has done. All right? He is still a child. He does not know any better. So for him to have taken it is not really sinful because of the fact he does not know any better. But he will learn one day. He will learn. And then and only then, if he continues to act in such a way... Will there be an excommunication? Get Gain Rumshku over on Rumble. What's going on, Rumble fam? Saying happy, my favorite saint of day. Yeah, absolutely. So not only are we in Passion Tide, so blessed Passion Tide. Yesterday was Passion Sunday, or sorry, two days ago was Passion Sunday, the last two weeks of Lent as we are preparing for uh, Holy Week, preparing for the celebration of Easter. So in many Catholic churches, especially those that have more of a traditional understanding, a connection to the tradition, we should say. It's probably more accurate. You would have noticed that statues were veiled, that the cross, the crucifix was also veiled as well, referring to the end of the Gospel of John 8, where it talks about how Jesus hid himself from the crowd that was trying to get him. And so in the same way, the, we, we see the crucifix is hidden during these last two weeks. We see the statues are hidden throughout the next couple weeks as well, right, to have that, uh, that rich symbolism of what's going on liturgically. All right, let us see here. Forever Sci-Fi, who is a member, Forever Sci-Fi has been a member for so long, he's got that purple star now. So Forever Sci-Fi, thanks for being a member. Thanks for being a member for so long. UIB Mad Dog, what's going on? Good sir, welcome back. Orange Hat, hail to you. By the way, I just forgot that, <laughs> I forgot to mention the other thing that's going on right now other than Passion Tide, but I think Orange Hat is getting on right onto it here. Open Forum. I have heard it. I have heard it is Saint Joseph's Day. Pray tell the significance, if you may, All Father. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it is the feast of Saint Joseph. Right. We we recognize, of course, the importance of Mary. Right, Mother of God, Theotokos. Right, Mother of Christ. It is through her. Yes, it is through her fiat. Right, that 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 I will to unite myself to the will of God. Right, by accepting that mission, that she has become known as Queen of the Saints. Well, it makes sense then that just as important in the life of Christ is his father. We oftentimes kind of overlook him because we don't have any recorded words, right? All we have from St. Joseph is, is action, right? But what were his actions? It was all about protecting Mary and protecting Jesus, right? Taking them out of where he was from, going to the land of Egypt to protect his family, then coming back as well. Think about how long that journey was and think about how Joseph was the primary protector of the family. Not to mention that, but he was the one that was teaching Jesus, right? How to be a good person, teaching him the Jewish faith. Remember, it was the primary role of the fathers, right? To be that example. And so we look then to the life of Christ and we see that even though there are not many words, really there are no words of St. Joseph, his presence is still very much felt. Remember that at the end when he is found in the temple, right? At the end of the uh, the infancy narratives that we call it, right? When when he's, you know, around the age of 12, he gets stay, he stays behind because he's talking and preaching in the temple, right? Just amazing all of these different elders about the rich knowledge of scripture that he has. And his parents come back and say, how dare you do this to us? And he says, did you not expect me to be in my father's house? But what did it say that happened after that? He submitted to his parents, from that day forward, he submitted to his parents and grew in knowledge, right? So that sense of obedience, the fact that God, man, right? The fact that God is man, the fact that Christ, God incarnate, submitted himself to the rule of his parents here on earth. One shows us the importance of that uh, that child and parent dynamic, the authority of the parents themselves. If even Christ, through his humanity, will submit to the just actions of his parents, how much more should we do the same thing? But also because we understand Mary as being our spiritual mother, when on the cross, what does he do? He says, St. John, behold your mother, right? Uh, you know, Mary, my mom, behold your son. That was an extension of the entire church as well. And so that's why we call Mary our mother. But that's also why we have a fatherly connection also to St. Joseph. So today is indeed the feast of St. Joseph, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's a feast of the first class, and in some areas, it would even be a holy day of obligation. Uh, unfortunately, we used to have a lot more holy days of obligation, and many of those have been dropped off. Amber Chamberpot, what is going on? Welcome here. Wendy Hunter in the chat. What's going on, Wendy? Glad I've been seeing you consistently here. 
been awesome seeing you on the Saturday, the Salty Saturday. So I'm glad that you are making this a part of your routine. All right, Michael Burgett in the chat. What is going on? Remember, if you have a comment or question, just put at Odin at the very beginning of your comment, just like the Morak has done here on any of the platforms that you are watching on. If you are a member, you don't necessarily have to, but it definitely helps quite a bit. Uh, the Morak says, hail, hail to you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Corey Cochran, what is going on? Welcome back. Luke Zilla hanging out in the chat also. UAB Mad Dog says, he's your boy, Odin, even if he likes pineapple on his pizza. You still love him. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I will, I will always love that boy no matter what he does. And that includes even if he eats pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Sam Blackburn, he knows not what he eats exactly, Sam. He knows not what he does. He knows not what he has done. Also, if we were going to base, uh, you know, importance on the decisions that he has made on, you know, food items, then I would also have to point out saying he's also at the age where he's starting to realize, oh, I can pick my nose and eat my boogers. Does that make boogers good? Right? If that's the logic that we're going to use. Uh, in fact, I would say that's a legitimate thing to say because I would put pineapple on pizza equivalent to that. <laughs> Virtual reality fitness. Welcome back. Steven, what's going on, bro? He tagged to say, your thoughts on Star Wars Acolyte trailer. Sally just doesn't feel like Star Wars at all. Full woke. I have not even watched it yet. I just don't, I just don't care because what, what else were we expecting? It's by Leslie Headland. It's it's been delayed to all get out, you know, through, you know, it's been delayed to heck and it is being created by a Lucasfilm that has consistently and persistently given us the same thing over and over again. I think I saw a little bit of it on like Twitter, you know how it has like that autoplay. So I watched maybe 5 maybe like maybe actually no, 15 seconds with no sound, just seeing the imagery. And just by looking at the imagery I thought, "Oh, okay. There's all these Girl, <laughs> there's all these girl younglings. It's like, okay, the majority of the class seems like they're all female. That's interesting. And then it's just like, okay, this is all just diversity. Okay, so Star Wars hasn't changed. This is still the same old Lucasfilm because ultimately who is still in charge? That's right. It's still Kathleen Kennedy. And until that changes and until changes at the top occur, nothing's ever going to change either. There's no hope. We already knew there was not going to be any hope for the Acolyte. And uh, this has just confirmed it even further. All right, the R tag to say one million hails to you and the chat. Well, thank you, the R. It's very generous of you. Steven, your thoughts on George Lucas on siding with Bob Iger? You think it's because he has a lot of stock for Disney? That could very well be the case, but we have to remember that oftentimes we put people on pedestals, right? We look at people through rose-tinted glasses, and I'm always going to be thankful for George Lucas for giving us the universe of Star Wars, right? You go to the OG you go to the original trilogy, those films still hold up. Those films are still a lot of fun. Those films birth the entire EU, the expanded universe and the novels. And oh my goodness, those are also just amazing add-ons, amazing stories. The universe and the world that he built is, is never going to be comparable to much of anything else. However, just because he's done that does not mean that everything he does is great. I, I'm not a prequel defender. I think they're hilarious. I have a nostalgic place in my heart for them, but they're not good movies. Objectively speaking, they're not good movies. Memes ultimately have saved those movies more so than anything else because th th there's a lot of stuff in there that's just not good. And, and then you look at the fact that he had trust in Kathleen Kennedy, that he was still willing right, to part with his beloved Star Wars for you know, what, $4 billion dollars. So he obviously had a price that he was willing to sell something that he loved. I, I have to look at that and say, okay, looked like it was a money decision to me. And, and that's just kind of the reality of the world. Unfortunately, most people and all of us fall into this every now and then in our own lives, right? We're sometimes driven by money. We're sometimes driven by the prospects of, uh, of success. But I think that if we look at it, we say that was a terrible decision made by George Lucas and that just because he happens to say something nice about Bob Iger does not mean anything because the dude's not perfect. And he's shown that actually consistently over and over again. Long gone is the George Lucas of old. We haven't had the George Lucas of old in a very long time. Because by that, I mean everything that we had up in the original trilogy. And maybe, maybe you could say some of, some of the stuff that we ended up getting in Clone Wars, which expanded things out a bit more 
of the of the prequel era but even that is still nothing compared to the originals let's see print screen who is a member says as a protestant cabrini was great might be my favorite movie of the year thus far and that's the thing about cabrini that's just so good is that it's not just made for for catholics like obviously i think catholics are going to have a very special connection more so than anyone else because she is a, a saint of of the church but we also recognize that the movie, and that's what I think the movie does a great job with, and some people have been critical of this. There's a lot of more traditional Catholics, you know, maybe even at the same level as I am, or maybe even more, who have been more critical of it because it has not been Catholic enough. But I think to myself, I think the main thing that we want from a, a story like this is to show the power that faith has. It shows the power and the effectiveness of faith. And it's from that that we can then say, well, what faith did she have? It was the Catholic faith. That is what motivated her. That is what brought about this heroic witness. This is what allowed her to, even at that time, when everything was against her because of her race, right? The, the fact that she was an Italian immigrant at a time when that was very difficult for Italian immigrants. The fact that she was a woman at a time when women actually were experiencing real oppression, right? These are all things that she had to overcome. And that can only ever be overcome through God's grace. And so I, I think that it is such a powerful witness to that very fact. But yeah, it's been it's been enjoyed by so many different people. Let's see. And the master of gaming says Bleecker Street should have marketed One Life better. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, I, I guess the point of what you're trying to say is that they didn't really market it enough because, yeah, I don't remember seeing a lot of trailers for it. But Bleecker Street is a much smaller production company. You know, that they're they're known more so for doing independent, small budgeted projects. So this this kind of just comes across as pretty standard for what it is that I've seen from them before. And I think ultimately because it is a smaller budgeted film, they don't need to really spend a whole lot more on marketing because this is the kind of movie and someone like Anthony Hopkins and the performances that he gives in this movie is I think going to be just enough to get people to come out and, and go see it and watch it and to have it be something that could even be successful. It's not a film that was made, you know, people oftentimes will say in the case of someone like Martin Scorsese, right? Uh, this was the common thing said about Killers of the Flower Moon. It's $200 million was spent, right, uh, on that film. And when I was talking about how the film was a massive flop, I had so many people, right? So many people simping for Martin Scorsese. And I, I love Martin Scorsese. But they came across with this 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 argument of, well, I'm sorry, but I don't think Scorsese cares a whole lot about whether it makes money at the box office. And I'm like, look, there are definitely many creators out there, many directors out there that will make movies as art. That's their primary way of, of creating uh, projects, right? It's not about money. It's not about uh, notoriety. It's, it's rather about trying to create art. Now, I'm not saying that Scorsese hasn't done that. It's a lot harder, though, to justify that argument if you're having $200 plus million being put into a single movie versus something like One Life where you're like, okay, very modest budget, right? Very low amount of money being put into it, expected just to be able to make its money back. They're not wanting it necessarily to be a huge hit because that, to me, tells me more so that it is more so about the art. Because clearly the profits are not what's the focus. Because if it was, they'd be spending a lot more on marketing. They would be trying to promote it a lot more than they already are. But when a film's being made much more for the art than anything else, usually those other things don't really come across as being that as important. And you don't see as much money and as much time being put into those things. So that's why, again, I think that you can say both of those movies, whether it be Scorsese or whether it be this film, are being made for art. But one is clearly much more authentic to that message than, than the other. Hopefully that makes some sense. And with that said, I guess I will just talk a little bit about it because I did indeed get to see the film One Life uh, just last night. I haven't been to the theater since Dune Part 2 first opened because I am just someone that doesn't have a lot of time these days to go see films. The unfortunate thing is also that my kids' bedtimes actually uh, are, are both around that 7 o'clock time. And because of that, 
any show time that starts at seven means I, I basically can't go to it, right? I can't really make those times work out. Luckily, this this film had like a 7.35 showing, so I was able to make it work out perfectly. And I went into this not really knowing a whole lot about it. I remember that Critical Drinker had given his recommendation to the movie, and I'd seen a couple of other YouTubers in the space uh, mention it and, and give praise to it. I saw some people mentioning it online in the comment sections on videos and things like that. And so all I really know was that it was starring Anthony Hopkins. I didn't even know that it was a World War II film. I remember at one point I had seen part of a trailer, and I saw that he was in front of a group, and so I just thought it was going to be about a guy on like on trial. Like that, that was the perception I had, because this is how little I knew about what the film actually was, and I'm so happy I went into it blind, because when I found out, oh, this is about a, a man from the United Kingdom who, during World War II, felt this need felt this desire to do something to try to help people in these countries that were being impacted early on by by Hitler's uh, Germany. So these were like the early days of World War II, right before the invasion of Poland. And so you have all of this stuff happening with Czechlo- uh, Czechoslovakia, and you get this information, too, in the very beginning about, okay, here's what's happening at this specific time. Um, basically, that they're trying to appease Hitler, and they're trying to give him certain lands and things like that. Like Again, part of part of the history of it. But then they go further in to say, oh, yeah, these are the number of people that are being driven out, right? These are the number of, of refugees that are being pushed out, and these are specifically the number of kids being impacted. And so this man, you know, played by, uh, you know, pl- played here by Anthony Hopkins feels so compelled that he goes to Czechoslovakia while all this stuff is going on with uh, a friend of his and then other contacts that he has, other people from the UK, and then other local uh, Czechoslovakians as well who are there trying to help people get out. And he is a part of an operation focused on how to get kids out because he's basically told, like, look, it just seems like you're some bleeding heart guy that is just coming here for a week trying to help out and you're going to overpromise and you're not going to be able to actually perform. You're not actually going to be able to to deliver and we don't want to give these people false hope. And he's challenged by that instead of falling into that typical thing that sometimes we can fall into when we're trying to help during a tragedy, right? Of thinking we're helping, but in reality, we're just making a bigger headache because if we can only volunteer for a week, but this is something that needs, you know, much longer lengths of time to actually accomplish, it can create issues. And so it's the story of this man who who quickly realizes and quickly shows, no, he, he actually does want to help. And so he goes through putting his job at risk, putting his life at risk, and all to try to save these kids. And there, there, there comes a part, and again, I know it's history. This is something that if you know anything about the story, you probably already know these things. Let me see if I can find out a little bit more. So British stockbroker Nicholas Winton uh, visits Czechoslovakia in the 1930s and forms plans to assist in the rescue of Jewish children before the onset of World War II in an operation that came to be known as the Kinder Transport. So yeah, I'd never heard of this before, and that's why I just love this film and I love the story even more because it introduced me to a person that truly is is the definition of what a hero is. And at one point, as I mentioned before, I don't want to spoil anything, there comes a point in the film, though, where you get this amazing performance from Anthony Hopkins. And if anyone's seen the film, you, you probably know this the series of events that's going on that, that leads to this. And I'm going to be honest, I was bawling in the theater. I, I was just, you know, I was crying. So there were, there were three, two or three times where I just lost it. And there aren't many movies that, that do that for me, right? You know, most, it's interesting because a lot of times it's films with like dogs, because I'm, I'm very much a sucker for dogs. Obviously, I've got I got my Hounds of Asgard here. Um, and usually it's like films with dogs. Like, don't ever watch the film Marley and Me. That film ripped my heart out because that movie promised a fun, loving movie about uh, a dog and about you know, the, you know, the development and growing up of a dog and all the exciting things. But then it doesn't tell you in the trailer or it doesn't really indicate in the trailer um, all that well. Oh yeah, we're also going to show you. You know, this is not really a spoiler because it's been around for so long, and I don't want you to see this film anyway. So I'm going to spoil it. Uh, the dog dies, and you see the dog on the table, and the guy's having the last conversation with his dog, and you're just like, "Oh my gosh, this was not the movie I wanted." Um, so different in this case, right? Because I went in with no expectations. It's very clear what the kind of movie, you know, what this kind of movie is going to be, and it does everything very effectively. The performance given by Anthony Hopkins, I think, is actually uh, matched by the film, the rest of the film, whether it be the rest of the supporting cast, 
right? Obviously, I went into it thinking that Hopkins was going to be on screen a lot more than he ended up being on screen. Still on screen quite a bit, but there is obviously a flashback to the 1930s. And so you see a younger version of himself. That was, I think, very, uh, very well cast. Jonathan Flynn uh, played that role. Helena Bonham Carter was in this movie, did not know she was in it. So when she showed up as uh, as his mom, I was like, oh, oh, she's in this. OK. And already my, my, my mind went, OK, this has already gone up a, a little bit of the caliber because at first I thought, oh, Anthony Hopkins just decided to do this project and he's the only big name in this. But then when I saw her in there, I was like, oh, dang. And then Jonathan Price comes in the film. As, as playing one of his, the older version of one of his friends. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, okay. So it just kept going up, it kept leveling up uh, for me. And I think all of it really just though culminated in, in those final moments of the film where again, it just, it gets you, it, it tugs at the heartstrings. For me, maybe cry two or three times. And uh, it, it's one of those good cries though, right? It's, it's one of those things where you feel like there's hope in humanity after you walk out of the theater. And it's just makes me happy that this film uh, was made and that now I know something about this this man, uh, Nicholas uh, Winton, that I did not know before. Just that fact that I that I know of his name and I know of what he did and and all the work that he and, and the people that worked with him did and the sacrifices they made and the number of lives lost. I want to say he, he rescued over 660 kids. And when you think about the other operations of that time and the survival rate, especially of children at that time, he did more for children than anyone else did. And, and the number of lives that he saved altogether, right? Not just these children was astronomical. And what I think the synopsis kind of leaves out is he talks about the the synopsis mentions the export of, of getting, you know, Jewish children out. The movie indicates though, that, it's not really focused only on Jewish kids, that there is a focus also on just other groups that are impacted, right? Anyone that is considered an undesirable, anyone that's considered not to be a part of the, you know, the quote unquote master race of, of Hitler. And so it's darn good though. If you have a chance to see it, it's not in too many theaters. As I said, it's a limited movie and I think it's well worth seeing. And it's not because it's like, oh, you need to see this on the big screen because I think you could enjoy this movie on, on a smaller screen. The reason why I think you should see it is because this this film deserves your money. There aren't a lot of films that deserve our money these days. There aren't a lot of films that should be supported. This is one of those films that absolutely should be supported. It's already definitely in my top 10 list right now for 2024. And this movie was so good, it made me, because uh, I have not forgotten, it made me want to create my, um, my ballot recommendations for the next year's Raven Awards, right? Because as I said, I'm going to try to get a running... Uh, ballot recommendations that way if you have a movie or you know of a th- person of a certain category that you want to nominate for the Ravens next year you don't have to just rack your brain uh, when we get to the end of the year to try to think of things you'll actually be able to put them in as as the year goes on this one's already going to be out there for me for being one of the best movies of 2024 anyway those are my thoughts on one life let's see what say you all right 739 in the chat Kinkane and Rumsky says I heard a rumor that St. Joseph once asked Mother Mary to put something different on his pizza. So she put pineapple on it. And after a delicious meal, they watched the Meg 2 together. Based. That is that is the most blatant heresy I think I've ever heard in my life, Kinkane Rumsky. I am disappointed in you. I am disappointed. In fact, I have to say this to you, Kinkane Rumsky. You leave me no choice but to declare you excommunicado. You left me no choice. That was uncalled for. Anyway, Hardwick says, Have you heard of the bad news about the new James Cameron 4Ks and Blu-rays? They're over-processed with AI upscaling, DNR, etc. True Lies got the worst treatment of the three. I can't say I'm surprised. We, we've seen his other transfers, right? All the transfers of his older films as have ever happened, I feel like there's always been issues with, or at least in recent memory. For instance, Terminator 2 has has notoriously had bad transfers for years now. So, and I've always assumed that that's mostly because of of James Cameron. The fact that the dude is so obsessed with Avatar and because of that is obsessed with new technology, I'm not surprised that he's like, oh, I'm going to do all the bells and whistles instead of just giving you a good transfer. So, yeah. Can't say I'm surprised. So, James James Cameron's going to continue to do James Cameron nonsense. 
Rob D says, Family Guy taught me that Jesus and Moses used guns to conquer the Romans. Where can I find this in the Bible? <laughs> well, 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 your mistake was thinking that uh, Family Guy was going to give you factual information about, about our Lord, but I suppose some people do that now, apparently. Sherry Allen, what's going on, Sherry? Wendy Hunter, trying to say, I've really enjoyed your shows and I'm trying to watch your streams. Well, appreciate that, Wendy Hunter. Thank you so much. Always great to have new people here. Nick Brown, what's going on? Welcome back, Carl Jacobs. What's going on? Snort Poopa says, Star Wars 24, a new no hope. Good Lord, I hope that never happens. Episode 24, good, good gravy. <laughs> Michael Burkett, trying to say, curious your thoughts about the rumors that Aaron Taylor Johnson has been offered to be the next James Bond. Yeah, they are just rumors at this point, uh, as of the last time I saw. And so we should treat them as rumors. Um, I, I don't hate the idea. It's better than some of the other ideas that have been floated around and some of the other rumors that have floated around. Uh, especially if this is what moves them away from trying to do, quote unquote, female Bond, then I'm on board. Uh, I like Aaron Taylor Johnson. I think he's a talented actor. Um, and I think that he probably has the chops to be able to, to pull off the role. Um, you know, it, it's always interesting with him because he does have quite a range in his performances. You think about how he really got known for doing the kick-ass movies. I, I don't know if anyone remembers that, right? That he played a, a much, he was a much skinnier fella. And he was the guy trying to be an act as a superhero, right, in, in the Kick-Ass films. But then he's gone on to do so many other films. He was in, I believe, well, wasn't he in the Godzilla 2014, the first of the MonsterVerse films? Um, and, and that one was 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 really the only good MonsterVerse film, and, and he did a great job in it. Uh, he didn't have a lot to do in the film, but hey, he, he was good in what he was on. And pretty much everything else that I've seen him in, he's been pretty solid as well. And he's been able to get jacked, too. So, yeah, I think that he probably would be a, a good choice. I'm not a Bond expert by any means, and so I'm sure some people might have legitimate criticisms about, about him being chosen. But he would fit this younger Bond that I think that they would more sensibly go with. You know, obviously, we've already had the old grizzled Bond. We've already had uh, that, that you know, person in their 40s, 50s uh, version of Bond, maybe late 30s. I don't think we've ever had someone... I think that the dude is probably in his 30s at this point, if I had to guess. But he definitely looks like he could be like a, a, a you know a late 20s kind of guy. And so maybe it would be a good thing to have someone play a younger Bond. I don't know. I don't know. What say you? Rob D, they are really all about the High Republic. With Star Wars now, they only put out two or three novels that are not High Republic. Yeah, and, and that's why, Rob D, I would say modern Star Wars is not even worth paying attention to. Nothing that they release that's new is worth anything. The one area, and I've mentioned this before, I will give Lucasfilm credit. I will. I will praise them and give them credit because there's one thing that they are doing that so far has been really good, and that is that they have been redoing their audio novels. They've been doing redoing their audiobooks. Sorry, my I lost my train of thought for a second. So they've been re redoing their audiobooks. And so they've basically been taking a bunch of these EU novels where either there was never an audiobook version or there was and it was an abridged version. It was an outdated version with, with bad voice work. Um, so for instance, Mark Thompson, who's my favorite voice actor in the Star Wars space, he has been doing the voice work for the X-Wing series, which is excellent. And so those have been excited, right? Every year or so, they're releasing a new book in the X-Wing series. I also just found out at the end of last year, they finally did a unabridged version of Outbound Flight. So up until last year, the only audiobook version of Outbound Flight that they had was an abridged version that I think Mark Thompson actually still did the voice for. So the fact that he's coming back to do the voice again, and now he's doing the full unabridged version, that's a good thing, Right. The only issue, the one critique I have of this amazing thing, because it is an amazing thing that they're doing, is that Mark Thompson has been asked to not do his original Thrawn voice. And if you ever remember, if you're an audiobook person, and if you've listened back to the Thrawn trilogy, right, the original Thrawn trilogy, the voice he did for Thrawn was, was, was badass. It was awesome. 
so much better than the the more wispy version. I just I don't even I can't even do it because it's just it's just not as menacing. It's not as cool. Um, and so that's the only real critique I have. But that's clearly not his fault because he's being directed, right? But the fact that they're still doing the novels, right? They're they're still doing these works, these EU uh, novels, is, is great. So I highly recommend that. That's the only thing worth buying, worth supporting, um, that is coming out as far as Star Wars Lucasfilm content. And again, it shows you how bad it is that these are things that came out decades ago that are, that they're finally giving like proper treatments to as far as audiobooks are concerned. Anyway, let's see. Print screen. Have you seen the new Furiosa trailer? I have not. I have not. I heard that there was another one that came out. I don't really know what else you could be putting out there. I just... To me, it's like, okay, it's going to be a movie about Furiosa. So this is going to be now the second Furiosa movie that we've got. Right? I actually liked Mad Max Fury Road, but I do think anyone who brings up the legitimate critique that it's not a Mad Max movie is spot on. Because Fury Road is not a Mad Max movie. It's a Furiosa movie. It's a Furiosa, it's a, it's, it's a Furiosa tale. And so when they announced this, I said, you already had a Furiosa movie. I guess we should maybe get an origin story. I like Anya Taylor-Joy. I think that she's a talented actress. So I, I'm excited for it for that reason. It looks like it'll have a lot of those really cool um, practical stunts like we're in the last one. But uh, yeah, I don't think the trailer's... The, the trailers are not going to be able to convince me anymore because I'm already wanting to go see it. So I don't think that's going to change much of anything for me. And they would have to really mess up for me to not want to see it anymore. All right, let's see. Steven had to say, breaking your thoughts on Conor McGregor returning back in the Octagon this summer. I don't watch UFC. I don't care for UFC. So uh, whoop de doo that, That's kind of <laughs> kind of how I feel about that. Uh, Ikthulu, hope you are well and happy Tuesday to you in the chat. To you as well. Thank you. Let's see. Laura says, In Cabrini, they framed the hatred for the Italians as centered on their race when I always assumed it was an anti-Catholic bias. Ah, okay. That's actually a really interesting point. Um, yeah, I kind of wonder if that was a a vision that they had to to try to frame it for the movie in that way. To try to go away from from that, yeah, I always did too. I think that's. It wouldn't surprise me if the actual history was a mixture, right? Because America very clearly with you know Protestant origins, with with you know Puritans and things like that. Um, but there's been Catholics in America for a very very long time too, just not nearly in as many numbers. And I think that the movie also shows that too, right? Because the bishop is very, uh, very wary, is very hesitant to do much of anything. Because Cabrini obviously has a lot of really big plans, and he's like, no, like it's it's taken us so long to get any type of foothold in this city because this is not our territory, right? It would be like trying to start a huge Catholic movement in the Bible Belt of America, right? You'll get some success, but it's not going to be the best. And at that time, especially, there was a lot more animosity between the two groups. Steven, where uh, were you a Nickelodeon or Disney Channel kid? What was your favorite show as a kid? Ooh, good questions. Um, I was both. I, I actually am both a, a Disney kid and a Nickelodeon kid. I, I loved Snick. Snick was the best, the orange couch. So I watched shows like All That. I watch shows like Clarissa, Clarissa Explains It All. Um, one of my all-time favorite shows of that era wasn't even all that as, as much as I enjoyed it, but it was actually a show. I'm sure most of you know this if you were alive at that time. Salute Your Shorts. Interestingly, did not have a lot of episodes. Didn't have a very long run. Salute Your Shorts, though. I love that show. It was it was so funny. The character of Donkey Lips, especially. Oh, gosh. Hilarious. So funny. But I watched a lot of them. Uh, hey Dude was another show I actually liked. I, I did... Horseback riding when I was younger, so I always had a connection to to that show. Um, Secret World of Alex Mack, so weird. That was a fun one. Are you afraid of the dark? So I think I was probably more so a Nickelodeon kid, if you can't tell from the <laughs> the examples that I'm giving. But I I did also watch uh, a lot of D Disney. For me, my primary connection with Disney when I was a kid was the Disney Channel original movies. Um, so films like Under Wraps, which I can't believe they remade. So stupid. Um, but the original Under Wraps, uh, original Halloween Town, um, 
even the sequel was kind of funny, just but also just so so bad. I mean, they're 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 both very cheesy. Luck of the Irish. Oh man, do love me some Luck of the Irish. That's a great one. Um, uh, Phantom of the Megaplex was so hilariously cheesy. I can't believe they got Mickey Rooney, the great Mickey Rooney, to be in that. They also got. I mean, think about how big Disney was though. They could get people like Mickey Rooney to do one of their Disney Channel movies. Uh, they, they were able to get big actors to do cameos and appearances in a lot of their stuff. And and yet, look at them now. It, it's like, oh my gosh, how far they've fallen. Uh, Laura then says, obviously Italian isn't a race. Yeah, I know, I know. But I, I it's a part of the, the lexicon, I feel like, to mention it in that way. But, you know, it is what it is. Iklulu, honest question, since when is Italian? I know. So, sorry if I misspoke, but you knew you knew exactly what I meant, man. Come on. Let's see. Miss Modern Muses, welcome back. Always great to have you here. Steven, has Dune 2 surpassed 500 million yet? If so, do you think we will get a Dune 3 movie or TV series? Did you watch my box office video for this past weekend? Doesn't sound like doesn't sound like you did. Did you look at my article at GigsandGamers.com? Doesn't sound like you did. CM Chunk, it was glorious seeing the Society of Magical Blank fail so badly. It was. Like, hilariously so, in fact. Let's see. Hardwick, did you know that Aaron Taylor Johnson's original name was Aaron Johnson? He changed it to Taylor Johnson when he married his wife, maiden name Sam Taylor Wood, who was 24 years older than him. Well, that's creepy as all get out. That w- He got married young then. Because I feel like I've always seen his name as Aaron Taylor Johnson since he was in the first Kick-Ass movie. Which he would have had to have been in his late teens, early 20s for. That's creepy. Michael Burgett. Oh, and I saw the trailer for One Life a lot when I saw other indie films. That's how I knew about it. Same for an upcoming uh, film, Ezra from Bleecker Street. Look it up. Looks quite good. Yes, um, I remember seeing the trailer for Ezra before One Life. It, it looks okay. It looks okay. Um, yeah, when it comes to those indie movies, sometimes it just feels a little too formulaic for me. But uh, but yeah, yeah, it makes sense though. Because if you go if you see a Bleecker Street movie, you're gonna get Bleecker Street uh, trailers usually, and independent films in general tend to have indie trailers before them too. Steven says, Your thoughts on Miss Marvel 3 and Ant-Man 4 not going to happen according to Bob Iger. Uh, I, to me, it's just is anyone really surprised by that? I mean, I guess part of me is because they've just been pushing this stuff nonstop for so long. You would think, why would they ever make a smart decision? How could they ever be in a place to make a, a, a smart and wise financial decision? And at the same time, though, I'm like, th- those movies should never have been made in the first place. Quantumania was a box office failure. And, and failed in the biggest way, which was it failed to set up the next phase of the universe. Because that's what it was originally meant to be. And then Miss Marvel 3, the Marvels, is the biggest box office bomb in MCU history. So, yeah. It makes complete sense to me. But at the same time, I am surprised that they finally kind of admitted the fact that those movies are terrible. Or can't make money, at least. All right, Steven, again. Your thoughts on Batman sequel being delayed again for a whole other year? Uh, Personally, I don't care. I was not big on the Batman. I thought that... um, uh, Patton said, "I think I think that he did a a good job. I think that he he did a fine job in the role, but the movie itself, I am not a fan of. There's parts of the Batman that are good. There's definitely parts that I like. The my my favorite part of the entire film is the performance by Colin Farrell as Penguin. That's the best part of the movie because you're like, wait, that's Colin Farrell. That that's an amazing one, amazing makeup, and two, an amazing performance because I never would have thought." That was the same guy. It honestly looked like they cast someone completely different, a completely different actor to play that role. And that also made me think, why would you spend that much time and money to get this actor just to put this much makeup on him to make him look like a different person? But hey, it works. It definitely works. Um, it, it's a great performance, and and I enjoyed that. But everything else about the movie fell apart. And, and ultimately, the story make, makes me hate it because of what they do to Riddler. They completely cuck the Riddler. 
They, they destroy him in the dumbest way possible. The very moment when Riddler gets on his YouTube channel, essentially, and goes, Hey guys, how's it going? I, I wanted to walk out of the theater. I was like, okay, this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. I don't care about this movie anymore. You took what could have been a really creepy, a really menacing villain, and you just turned them into a random YouTuber. A random right-wing fringe YouTuber. And it's like, oh, okay. Can't see what you're trying to do there. But but also, it just it failed on so many levels. Any good graces that were built up in the beginning completely destroyed by that one moment. Michael Bergat says, The one stat in the film that blew my mind... Nicholas Winton helped save over 600 children. The number of kids who survived the camps were likely only 200. Yeah, no, that too, right? They, they mentioned that in the film uh, because he's he's explaining to someone. Uh, interesting because I believe, yeah, the, the Maxwells are brought into this film. This is now like the second movie I've seen where the Maxwells, I think in Tetris, the Maxwells were brought in with, because, uh, uh, yeah, newspaper tycoon, right? And then in this film, I think it's the same Maxwell that's also brought in here because they're trying to get the story uh, sold and no one really knows exactly what he did because that's the great thing about this guy, um, Nicholas Winton, because he, he's not looking for fame. He's not looking to get a pat on the back. He, he, he wants these things to be preserved. And so ultimately, it's through talking with him that they realize, wait a minute, you were part of a team that saved over 600 kids' lives? And he's just like casually like, well, 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 yeah, I, I just, uh, yeah, it was the thing to do. And, and that's what just makes you appreciate him so much more. Um, but yeah, when they brought up the the stats, though, in, in the film, when he's like, all the stuff is coming out, he's, they're like, you do realize that you save so many kids' lives that this is just unheard of, right? It's really just miraculous. Uh, Laura says, I'm glad the Cabrini movie was honest about how hard she had to work within the church to get help for the poor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But you also, I think, I, I, I appreciate it because it doesn't just take that cheap way out. I think some people are, are, are wrongly portraying the film in this way. But it doesn't take it in the way of, oh, well, you can't do it because you're a woman. Right? It doesn't just keep it that way. It's No, there are literally these political structures that exist. Because you understand where the bishop's coming from at one point. Because it's like, look... If I step on too many people's toes, then the entire church, the entire diocese will be negatively impacted. So he is still thinking about the poor, but he's thinking about like that broader picture. So he's right and he's wrong, right? He's right because he's trying to protect the wider church, but he's also wrong because he's keeping someone from doing something on the ground, from doing something with her bare hands that can actually bring about the salvation, can bring about the the safety and the protection of many more innocent lives, right? The many more lives of children. So that's what I like about it, right? Is that it does it does have a bit of a balance there. And the best line to me, and I've mentioned this several times before, and it's got a lot of attention because some people are wrongly interpreting it, is when Cabrini says, men cannot do what we do. And, and I love that line because some people wrongly say, oh, she's trying to say that, that men can't do the things women can do. Anything you can do, I can do better. No, that's not at all what she's saying. She's saying when it comes to taking care of children, when it comes to going out into the street and taking these children and taking care of them like only a mother can, men cannot do what we can do. So it's actually a very based comment when you think about it because it's saying, yes, the natural instincts of a woman as a natural mother is something that is unique to woman, something that is unique and beautiful. And she says, you can't do this. You can't do what I do. These men can't do what we do. Because she's referring to her other sisters there. So it's actually very rich in complementarity, right? That, that men and women are different but complement each other because we have strengths and weaknesses that are oftentimes made up by the other. And so it's, it's a beautiful moment really honestly is. Wendy Hunter, time to say, I heard the ending of Marley and Me, and I was like, nope, yep, stay away, stay far away. That that film, that film made me sob, and I was so mad. Carl Jacobs, Marley and Me is a great movie. Every guy should see it. It's a great metaphor for the sacrifice of love and how it's all worth it, and it's a dog movie. No, 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 no. That all might be true, Carl Jacobs, but I'm saying right now, if you're a dog lover, lover do not see the film. Because it's going to make you depressed. <laughs> it's going to make you so sad. 
granted, I saw that back when I was in high school. So I was, you know, I think I'd been dealing with the the loss of, of one of my pets from my childhood at that point in my life. Um, so it probably hit me harder a little bit more, but yeah, I disagree to a point. Harwick, have you seen my dog Skip? I have not. And I, I kind of am very wary now of any movies featuring dogs now as recommendations. Michael Bargat says, I also love the one scene in one life when the group is gathered around the table and say how ordinary people can make a difference. Agreed. And that's what's so beautiful about the film. This guy, as it says, he's a stockbroker. He's not this ultimately rich dude. He's he he's not a, a philanthropist. He's just a regular guy. And he he sees the things going on. He's hearing about all these terrible things in the in the news. And all he says is, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. And I can't just sit around and do nothing. And and what's more important is that he does it. And that's something that is so lacking in our world today. So many of us know the problems, but so many of us, myself included, we don't have that same capacity, that same vigor to actively bring it about. And that's why this movie is important because it shows us that we can. It may not turn out the way we want. It's not going to turn out the way that we want. It's not going to be a perfect solution. It's not going to be a perfect uh, action on our part. But if we do it and we do it well and, and we do it carefully with thought, pr with prudence, right? Prudential judgment, we can make a difference. Let's see, the Morax says, I've had one life on my watch list since I saw the drinker's recommendation. My local theater is showing it, so I'll be there. Boom, Morak, awesome. Definitely a film to support in theaters. Kimberly G, Killian Shadow Cat, who's a member, says, Pineapple plus, pico, p Pineapple plus pico pizza equals love. Oh, Kimberly G. Sorry, Odin. I like it. I even get pineapple black olive pizza on Fridays of Lent. Sweet and salty is a great mix. Oh, not only are you throwing pineapple on your pizza, but then you're throwing olives on your pizza. It's been a while since I've done two of these in a stream, but I have to do it. You leave me no choice but to declare you excommunicado. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Let's see. Print screen. Could John David Washington sporting an English accent make for a good bond? Uh, no, because he's supposed... To, I don't know. Isn't John David Washington... Yeah, because it's Denzel's kid. So he's an American. No. James Bond is not supposed to be an American. <laughs> Sherry Allen says, Am good. Been busy hanging out with family from overseas. Very nice. Very, very nice. McThulu... No, we don't want a jacked bond. We want melt at the insinuation of a romantic fling. Okay. So <laughs> that that's what they say, right? They don't want a jack bond. They they want someone who who's just gonna run away from romance. Super says, hey, what is up, my dude? What's up, Super? Morak, 100 percent agree with you on Mark Thompson's work. He's the true voice of Thrawn. Yes. Again, just just try to find audio clips if you can of Thrawn trilogy. I don't think they've changed that uh, voice, the voice work for that yet. But, oh man, his his Thrawn is so, so good. King and Rumpskin Rumble says, I, My apologies, I had a project done on my house today, so I'm cleaning up after it currently. I hope my rumor pursuit of the truth earlier didn't get me John wicked. Uh, you, you need to listen back to it then. Wayward Noodle, who's a member, what's going on? Hardwick, Anya Taylor-Joy looks nothing like Charlize Theron. There's an actress named Alana Huffman who looks exactly like Theron. You might remember her as Black Canary from Smallville. Uh, might be true. I'm going to be honest. When it comes to a film like that, I don't care. If she looks close enough and with the makeup on, she looked close enough. All that matters to me more so than anything is the acting power prowess. And Anya Taylor-Joy is, to me, a much better actor than, than Charlize Theron. And also, Charlize Theron is insane in real life. And she abuses her children. And that that's not me being hyperbolic. The fact that she will treat the kids, her kids the way that she does with all of the, of the gender stuff, that's child abuse. And so I'm happy that Anya Taylor-Joy has replaced her. And I don't care if she doesn't look like her because anything 
is better. They, they could have honestly cast anybody in that role and it would have been a better decision because that woman should not work ever again until she has a massive change of, of heart and, and hopefully becomes sane one day. See, Laura says, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is the hot actress right now, so she gets the part. <laughs> She's so hot right now. <laughs> I love Snick. Yes, Snick. Uh, Sahil, I never got in Dragon Josh. That was a little bit after me. That, that was a little bit later in my childhood, so I never got that. Harbuck says, I bought a DVD of Nickelodeon's Hey Dude at Dollar Tree a while back. I've never watched it, though. <laughs> yeah, they have a bunch of Nickelodeon stuff on, is it Peacock? No, no, Paramount Plus, Paramount Plus. And so I was able to get a bunch of those episodes on, there's, there's the service play on where you can record your streaming services and it's, it's actually legal to do so. And so I think I got all of Hey Dude. It was good though. See, Wendy says, I loved all the shows from Nickelodeon too. Yes. Nickelodeon had so many great things. Prince Screen as a member says, not the same kind of Nickelodeon show, but SpongeBob will always be the best. Okay, yeah. So I, yeah, SpongeBob, OG SpongeBob. That was on when I was in middle school, early high school. So I, I definitely got into early SpongeBob um, for a while. You know, for a while. I, I love the later episodes to me got a little too weird. So I like the ones that were in syndication, like the first two, I guess two, three seasons, maybe. I don't remember how many episodes were per season. Um one of my favorite episode moments still is when they first introduced uh, Sandy. It's Sandy, right? The squirrel. And so Patrick is trying to teach SpongeBob how to be fancy. And so, and so, and all, 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 all I hear in my head is always just Patrick in the background going, Pinky! Pinky! So good. Oh, man. Let's see. Laura had to say, sounds like someone didn't watch the video this week. It does sound like that. Definitely sounds like that. And I will call him out. <laughs> Let's see. The man with the orange hat says, haven't seen Dune 2. Did they leave it open at the end? Sheesh. Wait, what? I'm a little confused in the, on the context there. Um. Oh, man. Yeah, the ending of Dune 2 is just garbage. Because it, it has, it's about as on the nose with messaging as you possibly can. For those that have not seen it yet and don't care about spoilers, not that it's much of a spoiler or anything because it's just bad decision making in general. It ends with Cheney. That's right. The last scene you see, the last image you see is Cheney, who is now on her own, being an independently strong woman. That's nowhere in the books because, let's be honest, that character was completely just made up. The name Chaney was thrown onto it. They had the romance the same, but ultimately, completely different character. Ruins the movie. Hardwick. Kigas was in 2010. He was billed as Aaron Johnson then and was 20 years old. He got married two years later. Okay. Uh, again, I'm still going to say I've always seen him as... Aaron Taylor Johnson, but okay, Hardwick, you keep on being you, bud. Steven, Italian, not a race, buddy. Just to clarify, where where you been? I feel like that's already been discussed. <laughs> Laura, you know I love me some Patman, but <laughs> some Patman, but I really didn't want a sequel. Nope, should not get a sequel. Gary Band just out of the words and it says they made the Riddler a pineapple pizza lover. Exactly, that is exactly what they did. Let's see. Uh, Master Gaming says, After death, the shift to Cabrini didn't do as well as Sound of Freedom. That is indeed true. And I already said I'm going to talk about it. Rob D says, I want the Marvels 2 Captain Marvel 3, but I want it to have only a $5 million production budget or a billion dollar production budget. Dang, that's quite a range there. Jacob Reed, what's going on? Says, Happy St. Joseph's Day. Absolutely blessed feast of St. Joseph. General Wingster, who is our pet troll. Thank you for the $2 super chat who says, hey, Odin, where are my tacos? Sorry, I know it's Taco Tuesday, but uh, I already ate them, General Wingster. I already ate them in your face. Harry says, my dog Skip is a great movie, but the ending would definitely make you cry. Yeah, that's that's why I probably will never see it. 
Cthulhu, God doesn't care if you are successful. He only cares if you try. Yeah, um, yeah, Cthulhu. I don't know if I've ever shared that before. One of the most powerful things ever shared uh, during the Sacrament of Confession, of Reconciliation. One of the best pieces of advice that was ever given was by a Jesuit priest. Uh, rest in peace, Father Skiro. And he gave me advice that I think I will never forget. It says, God doesn't judge you based on how much you succeed, but as you said, but rather on how hard you try. So it's just kind of amazing that you said that because that those are those words that I connected very strongly with uh, from, from that time in my life back in high school. See, Jonah Wingster, Kimberly G needs better taste in pizza. Thank you for the $2 super chat. And yes, yes, you are absolutely correct. She needs, she needs some help. <laughs> the R. Wouldn't olive and pineapple pizza be good for Lent because of the torture involved? Ooh, R. That's a good point. That's a good point. I guess the issue I have is that someone is someone in the chat is putting it on their pizza because they enjoy it. That's that's the problem. Let's see. Wayward Noodle. Have you seen the trailer for Damsel? Millie Bobby Brown, Millie Bobby Brown other than Stranger Things, cannot get a break. Never want to call a film dead on arrival, but this film can beat Madam Web for cringe. Yeah, I know that. Uh, didn't Tr Critical Drinker also do a video on this? I think I either saw part of it or... No, I, I watched it. I watched it. Um, so, yeah, it, it looks awful. It looks awful. The whole concept of it is just really silly. Though I think it is kind of funny where it's like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, yeet you off this this cliff right here. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Annihilator. What's going on? Uh, says, hello, Odin. Your thoughts on the Sasuke sisters past controversy supporting LGBT children. Past tweets is recent 2016, 2017. I like how you say recent. That's still several years ago, dude. So my thoughts would be, who are they now? What kind of people are they now? That That's all I'm going to say about it. I feel like that's happened a lot. There's been so much controversy surrounding them. And it honestly just feels like a lot of it's being dredged up by drama farms people that are just obsessed with causing drama and need attention so they just bring all of this stuff they dredge up all this stuff from the past just to get it and it's honestly pathetic there's a reason why i don't get involved in a lot of these battles and a lot of these controversies because it's just such it's so stupid it's such a waste of time and it's just pathetic it's sad it really is General Wingster, thank you for the two dollars. Says the super chest says all my kids are non-binary. You can't stop me. I did, I, I knew you were a troll, General Wingster. I did not know that you were evil. King and Ramchik says feelings on that so Raven. I watched some of it when I was a kid, but uh, I was more into like in shows that came out around the same time. Smart Guy was a fun show. Uh, Sister Sister was a fun show as well. Man, Clarissa spent. Oh, I, I can't believe I forgot the best one of all. Boy Meets World is the greatest show of all time. Boy Meets World. Because you look to the early episodes, and they're phenomenal in how well they portray kids. Middle school. And then you get into the high school years, and you're like, oh, man, this is great. And then you get to the college years, and you're like, man, even this is still great. There's not a season of that show that I don't like. And it has a lot to do with not just the writing, but also the actors and, and how they grew together. They they did such a good job. They were even able to make a show like Girl Meets World watchable. Because I honestly, like, I only watched that entire series because I knew there were several episodes where a bunch of the old original characters came back. And it honestly made those moments worth it. Because you're like, okay, I got to get through all this drama stuff. And you're like, okay, it's not as bad as it could be. You know, believe me, Girl Meets World, if that had been made it like just a couple years ago, could have been a lot worse, could have been a lot different. But it ends up being like fine, but you only really watch it because you're watching it for the OG Boy Meets World characters. It's funny just because the whole concept they're trying to say is this is your world now. Right? It's not my world anymore, it's your world. And yet the only thing I think keeping anyone interested in that show was 
the originals. <laughs> and it, you kind of notice this towards the end because they start to rely a lot more on those storylines. If anyone saw it, you might, you might know what I'm talking about. Let's see. Super says, I don't need it. I don't need it. I need it. <laughs> Who loves orange soda? Kel loves orange soda. Is it true? Mm-hmm. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. Ooh. Love it. General Wingster, thank you for the $2. Super trash. I saw this one coming. We need to talk about that. <laughs> Correction. Sub-Saharan African slave trade. Not the Saharan slave trade. But I appreciate your attempt, General Wingster. I know you're probably limited by characters there. Uh, but Wingster, thank you, man, for, for the super chats. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hardwick says, did you see the video of Denis Villeneuve explaining why he changed Johnny? No, and I don't want to. Because it doesn't matter. Because he can justify it however the heck he wants. It's not going to make it any better. It's not going to fix the problem. And it's not going to change the fact that he made a completely different character. Rob D. Dick Cheney is in Dune Part 2? <laughs> what? <laughs> King and Rumsky. You know Italy's a country, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love you guys. <laughs> I love how this is now the new thing. You do realize that this is a country, right? You do realize that that's not a race, right? Uh, Master Gaming, why are most people in the West abandoning religion or find religion problematic? Because this has been the problem of the human experience since our very creation, and more so, so more specifically from our very fall, from grace, is we have always tried to fill the void that can only be filled by God with anything and everything else. Because we fall so very quickly into pride, we fall so quickly into our our own self-obsession and self-love, unhealthy self-love, that we don't want to admit that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we are flawed. We don't want to admit that we need help. We don't want to admit that the help that we need is above and beyond ourselves. It's something that we can't just go out and buy. It's not just something that we can go out on Amazon and get. It's not something that we can get two-day shipping on. It's something that's going to take a lifelong journey. We don't like that. We live in an age, especially today, of instant gratification. And so when it comes to the area of faith, we're talking about almost the opposite of, of instant gratification. Because we're talking about lifelong journeys here. So that's the reason why. Because it's uncomfortable. We want, we want it now. Oh, I, why should I believe in God? Because I asked God one time to give me what I wanted. And he didn't give me what I wanted. We live in a very spoiled brat, spoiled generation today. I think ultimately that's that's a big reason as to why that is the case. Anyway, I do want to talk about this. Um, we still have some time, so let me just make sure that we do talk about this because it was mentioned earlier. And I said I would talk about it a little bit of box office. So just a bit of a comparison here, right? So the, the question initially was asked about why Caprini uh, has seen massive drop-offs. And I mentioned, right, because that's kind of the nature of these movies. They oftentimes have decent opening weekends, big drop-offs. This is true of most faith-based uh, movies, especially in this case for a movie that is very explicitly Catholic and also is having a difficult time finding an actual audience. And I say that because it's not universally loved by Catholics seeing it. It's not universally loved by non-Catholic Christians seeing it. And so what that means is that it's appealing to a very narrow audience that that's not universal in scope and so that's that's ultimately going to limit how much success it can ever get as i said if 20 people go see a movie and 100 percent of them love it and 100 percent of them give it an amazing rating uh, rating on a site and they go out and tell people to go watch it that's still only 20 people that are doing it versus let's say instead you've got a thousand people go to see a movie and 90 percent of them love it and 90% of them, right, okay, 90 is less than 100%, yet because you have a lot more people, it's a larger portion. It's a larger number of people being brought in. So that is one of the reasons as to why that is the case here. But what I will say is that Sound of Freedom, of course, was able to hit something well beyond. The problem that existed was Sound of Freedom is not a faith-based movie. It was painted that way. 
by mainstream media shills trying to tear it down, try, trying to keep it from being successful. But it's not a faith-based movie. So it's, it's not in the same category as a film like The Shift or, or Cabrini, for instance, which are very much rooted in, in faith in, in many ways, very directly in faith, right? The Shift, the bad guy is literally Satan, is the devil. It's a modern telling, essentially, of the book of Job, from what I've been told. And then Cabrini is the life of, of a Catholic saint. Sound of Freedom, not a religious film, but also is uncovering something that is truly nefarious, that is truly evil, and got so many people talking about it from the get-go that it was able to build up something that no one would have seen coming. Keep in mind, its second Saturday at $10 million did better than its first Saturday. It's almost unheard of for movies to do better in their subsequent weekends than in the beginning. But the legs on Sound of Freedom were so good because it had, again, $5 million on first Friday, right? $41 million by the end of its first weekend. And so it already had a good starting point to then build off of versus the shift, $4.3 million opening weekend, Cabrini 7.1. So I bring this up too because in comparison, the Cabrini is actually doing pretty well against the previous faith-based movie from Angel Studios. Same point right now, $8.7 million was made by The Shift, $13 million currently made by Cabrini. If you look at the end result of The Shift, as far as the last day of tracking, they had $12.1 million reported. And so the fact that this film's already there tells me that this film has a potential of maybe doubling its current amount. Or at the very least, doing significantly better than that. But as I mentioned also, because we're not going to hide numbers here, Cabrini has a much higher budget. They, the guy saved up $50 million, was able to raise $50 million to make the movie. So even if it does somehow, in a best-case scenario, double its amount and get to $26 million somehow, and again, that's a very off chance, it still would be a far cry from being able to make its money back. But again, two things can be true. It's in a lot of financial trouble because it's got a long way to go, but it is still doing a lot better than their last Faith movie. Let's see. Hardwick, Leif Schreiber, and Naomi Watts are even worse than Charlie Theron. Not only did they transition one of their sons at a young age, but they're also creepy possible stuff involved. Yep. Uh, I, I hate that. I hate that so much. Thinodos Felicitas says, they hate Eric July so much, I saw a channel making money off of channels that hate the Ripperverse. And it, it's just, it honestly is sad. It, it really is. I mean, you, you think about Eric, you think about what he's done and what he's accomplished, and it honestly just feels like there are a bunch of people that are just jealous of his success. And so all they can do is try to stir up stuff because that gets them clicks, that gets them attention, that gets them super chats, that gets them all this love. And it's like, it, it, it ruins any reputation that they may have at one point had. Master of Gaming says, people doing drama on the internet is why I won't, uh, I don't want to make YouTube videos. Yeah. I agree. Steven, it's quiet. Too quiet. Be careful, extra crap. Hardwick, I don't think you'd be happy about what happened to Rachel from Boy Meets World in real life. I feel like I, I feel like I found out, and it was, uh, man, I, yeah, I, I forget exactly what it was, Hardwick, but I think I remember hearing about it at one point. General Winkster, well, it's an early day tomorrow. Good night, Odin, and chat. Good night to you, General Winkster. Laura says you handled that question about the Sasuke sister like a chomp. Well, thank you. Because I want to answer the question, but at the same time, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's just people trying to drama farm. Uh, Wendy Hunter, the hole in your heart can only be filled by God. Absolutely. St. Augustine said it best. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And he knew better than anyone else because he tried everything. Literally any religion you could imagine he tried at that time. It wasn't until he found the Catholic Church, though, that he finally felt home. Ichthulu, 
LOL, God didn't give me the motorized Tonka dump truck for Christmas. <laughs> so now I'm an atheist. Yeah, that that's basically where people are these days. Now, again, there are definitely some that it's a much more serious issue, right? It's I prayed for a family member. I, I played for a friend that was in tr- it was in trouble, that was struggling. I was struggling and, and it felt like I wasn't being helped. But then all I can do is say, but look at people that have it so much worse because there almost always is going to be someone that has it worse than you. And think about it, even in those cases where things have been so much worse, there have been somehow things that have come out. I mean, look at this in, in the film we just talked about, One Love. Terrible thing that happened. It, it shouldn't have needed someone like him to, to, to have to go in and save kids. And yet, without this grave evil, there would not have been this opportunity for him to have this heroic witness. And so it, it's the problem of evil. It's the biggest problem. It's it's the number one thing that oftentimes leads people down that road, at least that road to question. And yet one of the best responses that we can really give to it is, yet, think about how much good oftentimes can come out of it. I think I've mentioned this before. If you think about 9-11, terrible event. If we could take it back, I'm sure any of us would do anything that we could, too, to save and preserve those lives. And yet we also think about, was our country ever as united as it was on September 12th? Now, we lost that because we're broken and because our, our egos got back in the way very quickly. But you think about, it, were we ever as united as a country as we were on January 12th? Would there have ever been people willing to give their lives to save others? United 93, right? There, there's this heroic witness that can come from even these terrible events. And that's what I often... Uh, look to and find and find solace in Stephen. Although we're all having fun saying Nickelodeon reference, did you watch the dark side qu- behind the scene? Quiet on the set. Fortunately, some of the young actors actresses on on Nick were abused. Yeah, I remember hearing about it, but no, I didn't watch it. It, it just it came across as one of those where okay, it seems like there might be something here, but also it might be it, it almost seems to like maybe it's a, an attempt to get money. I don't know. I'm saying that as someone who's not watched it, who's not done research on that, so take that with a giant grain of salt. Harwick says, Maitland Ward, Rachel from Boy Meets World, is now one of the highest paid hardcore. Oh, yeah, that's that's what it is. That's what it is. Yep. And it's sad. I feel so bad for her. And I can't help but think that a, a reason as to why she fell so far was because of the experience of being on a show like that. Because she, unfortunately, um, was was probably viewed in, in a very objective way. People objectified her, unfortunately. Prince Green, did you just say one love, one love, one heart, one destiny? <laughs> Rob D, I don't know if I'd want to be alive in the 1100s when religion started taking off. I feel like I would have been killed for worshiping or not worshiping something. Yeah, that, that's always the caveat, right? Whenever people say, you know, what time in history would you want to live in? It's like, well, no time is ever better than than the present because that's the time that we have. That's the time that we're in. You know, we, we, we can't change that. But in the case of like a fantasy of like, oh, man, but, you know, just hypothetically and some possible, possible hypothetical, I always say, yeah, I would love to live in the Middle Ages, but I would want to bring modern medicine with me. <laughs> At the very least, right? Um, th- those would be the things, right, that you did typically add in. All right, we're going to start to wrap things up here. Uh, so let's see. Hardwick says, Denis Villeneuve said that Frank Herbert intended the ending of Dune as a warning, not a celebration. I.e. Paul is true no savior. He changed Johnny. Hardwick, I literally said, I don't care. So why would you tell me when I was like, I haven't seen the video and I don't really care what he has to say because it doesn't matter. And no, he does not justify his decision. He might say that's the reason, but he's full of it. And this is coming from a guy that's a big fan of Denis Villeneuve. Come on, dude. Super. I think part of it is the way it's taught, though. It's taught, too. Most people who know of the people I know who are agnostics or atheists are those who suffer tragedy and neglect at an early age. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet, 
it's interesting because oftentimes people that suffer from tragedies are the ones that are most religious. Because it's not until you're at your lowest that you oftentimes find God. Because that's also one of those those weird um, paradoxes, right? That it's when we're at our lowest, it's when we're at our saddest that oftentimes we're actually more open to God. So as true as it might be that there are people that have that experience at an earlier age and so because of that reject religion, I think you also have something very different in today's world because now we've reached a point of such complacency. And honestly, it's it's especially with the youth, it's laziness. Because, you know, things will be brought up in, in a classroom about different aspects of faith. For instance, things like fasting. And I'll, and I'll ask for opinions on, on fasting and I'll, I'll give quotes about the power of fasting. And the number of people who, who, who will say, yeah, it seems like it, it could be good, but, um, but it sounds really hard. So, again, I think that it really comes down to this laziness, this malaise that's kind of set over. This, again, instant gratification. And so since God can't be that energy drink that they are consuming every single day and can't be Google giving them the answer, can't be on Snap, can't be their Snapchat, can't be their Instagram, can't be their notification, getting them that, that dope dopamine hits, right? Whenever they want, exactly how they want, they fall away. That's one of the many reasons why my wife and I have had open conversations about we're probably not going to have our children with smart devices. And, and this is coming from a very tech guy. I love, I do like tech, right? I, I love tech. I have this microphone. I've got my audio interface, this webcam, my YouTube channel. There's a lot of things I have in tech. But I think it's because of that that I can see even more so the impact that it has. Because if I, even as an adult, have to step away, and because I am an adult, I can step away, imagine now you put that same drug into the hands of a child, a developing child, and you see why we're having the problems that we're having today. It's not hard to see that at this point. I mean, the studies are even clear on this too, but you don't even need those studies because you can just look around and say, oh yeah, one of the things that always gets me, there's this video that goes around, interestingly enough, on social media, it seems at least once a year or so, and it's a video of what school looked like in the 1990s or the early 2000s. And it shows you all these kids just hanging out. And people always have like this meme question where it's like, hmm, what is unique about this? And immediately people get it. They say, none of them have phones. They're all talking to each other face to face. Conversation. And you look at a school today and what do you see? On their phone. As adults, we do this too. But I think because a lot of us were you know, introduced to a smartphone when we were a little bit older in life, we were able to develop those different skills early on so that we can at least recognize when we have a problem, right? Recognize when when we're going off a bit. But now imagine that you are developing when the stuff is going on. Oof. King and Rumsky. Outside of the top tier Nickelodeon characters, which would you be? Do you mean which would I want to be or which would I be in real life? Morak, thanks for the stream tonight. I'm off to watch Shogun. Have a good week. Oh, yeah, Shogun. Uh, I'm going to watch, by the way, tonight there is a documentary coming out. Um, as you all know, I'm a Catholic, devout, uh, practicing Catholic, traditional Catholic. I identify I identify as a traditional Catholic. Uh, <laughs> and so there's a great documentary series called Mass of the Ages. There have been two episodes so far. Part three is debuting tonight. I think it already may have debuted, so I'm probably going to watch that. Because part two was fantastic. And uh, I'm hoping part three is also great. Steven says, I'm going to visit Cali for spring break. What do you recommend having at in and out Happen to know any good secret menu uh, that you recommend? No, because I I tend to not to like the secret menu, menu stuff. Because it's a lot of stuff I wouldn't put on my burger. It's a lot of stuff I wouldn't put on my fries or anything like that. Um, the shakes are really good. Burger and a shake. Can't go wrong with that. But I will say this, Stephen, and this is going to be controversial for some. I would say save some money and go to Fat Burger instead. I lived in California for nine months. And the first meal I had, the first night I lived in California, was from Fat Burger. 
And I just was amazed. Oh my gosh. The size of this meal for the price that I'm getting it at. Shakes, burgers, the whole deal. Was, was solid. So I would say that. I would say that. Super says, I find it's 50-50. And there's no middle ground. They either cling to faith or reason. Orange Hat says, All Father raising his voice? Is that a warning or just a grumble? Oh, that that's that's just no no no. If you're talking about uh, my conversation and and my interaction with Hardwick, I'm always talking to Hardwick that way. You haven't picked up on this at this point. <laughs> Print screen. Have you seen the photos of Timothy Chalamet as Bob Dylan? No. Super. Another one I've seen is the atheist is a child of parents who Christian but don't follow the teachings. But again, why don't they follow the teachings? As I said, a lot of times it's because they don't want to do the work. And it also has a lot to do with what they're being exposed to on social media. Because they think they know everything. And that's always kids. Kids always think they know everything, right? But now even more so because we literally can look up almost anything on these little devices right here. We can we have literally the world of knowledge in the palm of our hands. And what do we choose to do with it? Lord knows I don't use this as a tool as much as I know I should. But that'll have to be it for tonight, everybody. This was a great show. This was a lot of fun. I uh, hope that you had some fun as well on this 488th episode of the Welcome to Asgard podcast. For the 36 people still hanging around, thank y'all. Appreciate it. Uh, General Wingster, thank you very much for your very generous support through that super chats, through those super chats earlier. Really do appreciate your support and also your dedication for being uh, the pet troll on the channel. Uh, Snow Golem coming in over on Odyssey. Hail a little late. It's okay. It's okay. We're wrapping things up here, though, but I appreciate you hanging out and uh, stopping by nonetheless. So with all of those things uh, being said, uh, let's just think about what we got going on. So I got my ticket already to go see Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. Is it Frozen Empire, Frozen Kingdom, Frozen Empire? I think it's Frozen Empire. On Thursday night, so hopefully I'll be able to actually do that. So be on the lookout for a review posted on Criticless when I get out of the theater for that. And uh, yeah, it's Passion Week, right? We just had Passion. We're in Passion Tide right now. Feast of St. Joseph as well. Um, there's a great prayer I recommend y'all looking up. Look up St. Joseph Prayer, Terror of Demons. It's one of the titles of St. Joseph. And it is an awesome prayer. Just the, just the title alone is amazing. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. I love it. I love it. Uh, Steven, yeah, I would say get, I, it's been so long since I've been there, but you'll notice that there are different levels where it's a single patty, you need a double, triple, quadruple. There's there's some that's even higher. I think two or three patties is, is, is the perfect sweet spot. And then a, a large chocolate shake. That's what I would do. I'm a simple guy, but I, I thought that they were all very good. Get that shake, though. Actually, you know what? If you're going during Lent, don't get that shake. You shouldn't be having that anyway. Wait until Easter, and then you can celebrate it as best you can. Uh, Eagle Rider, Rosetta Allen, Rosetta, been a while. Glad to see you in the chat. Hope you're doing well also. But we are wrapping things up here. Wendy Hunter, thank you for being here. Hope that you had fun. Ikthulu, always share that forgiveness is the only way to live. Love your show each week. Thank you very much, Ikthulu, and absolutely agree for sure. Luke Zilla, thank you for being here. Kimberly G, also thank you for being here. Forever Sci-Fi, the R also. And with all that being said, uh, I'll see you all next week on Tuesday or on Friday Night Sites if you hang out with us on Fridays. Anyway, you guys are all amazing and beautiful people. Uh, next week will be Holy Week, so we will have a show still, um, and I think that the shows will still be consistent. I won't be on Friday Night Tights next week, though, because I'll be home, home being hometown, and also it's Good Friday, so just not a day really appropriate to stream anyway, but uh, this week, I will see y'all then. Anyway, have a wonderful rest of y'all's evening, everybody, and as always, God bless.
And now for a huge shout out to all of my chosen of Valhalla members for the month of March, starting off with Father Luca Illick, Rosetta Allen, check out her YouTube channel, YouTube channel being Eagle Rider. Miss Mon Muses, check out her YouTube channel as well by the same name. Matt317, check out his Twitch channel by the same name. Mr. Roy and the K-Man, check out the K-Man's website at xtheboundaries.co. If you want your name shouted out at the end of every live stream and video, or if you want your name listed at the end of li every live stream and video, make sure to check out the top link in the video description on how you can find out where to join on Patreon, Subscribestar, YouTube channel memberships, pretty much anywhere that you can think of that you would have as a mainstream source to be able to support the channel, you have the means to do so. And you get also special perks like having access to an exclusive podcast that I do every single month, access to a giveaways channel that I host on my give uh, on my discord channel and also of course the ability to have your channel shouted out at the end of every single live stream you guys are all amazing and beautiful people have a wonderful rest of your day and as always god bless